is the time in our service that um, we especially focus our attention on the Word of God and pray that God will allow it to speak to our hearts. Uh, I, I hope that uh, when this time comes that that's our expectation and not that it's going to be Pastor Doug talking. We want the power of His Word to speak to us. We've been going through a series dealing with one of the great books of the Bible, the book of Job. And this would be the third presentation in that line. And the message today is about despair and faithless friends. I'm going to talk a little bit about friendship and relationships and, and how important that is. Uh, years ago, we don't do it so much anymore, uh, our family used to kayak. And every member of the family had a kayak. And I think that's me. And the only reason I can tell is because I had all the blue stuff. Uh, and we would go down principally the Eel River because it was right near Covalo and there's some great kayaking. We've gone down the Middle Fork and the South Fork and the North Fork of the Eel River. And if you know anything about kayaking, there are varying degrees of difficulty depending upon the rapids and the waterfalls. It goes anywhere from one to six. And without exaggerating, we went through all different levels. <laughs> <laughs> and and it, it got pretty exciting. It wasn't always planned. Uh, sometimes, um, I remember one trip in particular, we were going to go down the North Fork of the Eel River. And we'd done it before, but we usually did it later in the year. The water was lower. And uh, when the water's too low, it's not much fun because you're scraping bottom. You have to pick up and drag your boat through the dry sections and get where it's flowing again. So we thought, oh, there was a good rain. Let's go now. And so Karen and I were talking this morning. I was trying to remember, there's like five or six of us on this trip, Karen and I and the two older boys and some neighbors. And our neighbor's wife took all the boats in this big truck and we, they brought us up to this wilderness area where they dump us out with our gear. And we have camping gear because it's an overnight trip. Um, you drag your boat through the woods for a few uh, miles, it seems like, uh, and um, you got your camping gear and your food and everything, your paddle all strapped in there, and you're wearing your wetsuit because uh, the water was cold. And um, we got down and we found out when we finally got to the river that it rained much more than we thought and it was just roaring. And we actually got scared. We thought, there's no way out. You can't call. There's no cell phone service back there. And this is a very remote area where they actually have just sheer rock walls that go up on the right and the left and you're just going through this canyon. This is a part of the country, believe it or not, in California where you can be on the river for, for two, three days and not see a single person, no house, no road. It's just very remote. And we started down the river and I'll tell you, we were doing a lot of praying. Because when you fall out in, in the water's high and it's rough, you can get caught in a whirlpool or an eddy and you can't get back up again. You can drown. And um, we'd fallen out a few times and gotten kind of sucked under and caught or you get pulled under a log or something. And one thing we learned that was very helpful is how to use, when you're kayaking with more than one person, which is always a good idea, how to create the pontoon effect. The pontoon effect is if you're going through a place in the river where it's wide enough, you come alongside another member of your team, you grab the lip of their kayak opening, they grab the lip of your kayak opening, and you steady each other as you go through. And you have a much better chance of avoiding a turnover if you do that. And you could even go where there's three wide places in the river, sometimes for fun. We get four or more of us. We're all kind of linked together, holding each other's boats. And you'd be amazed. The water could just be bouncing. You could be going through number four rapids. As you don't let go of your neighbor's boat, and they don't let go of yours, it steadies you like outriggers, and it keeps you from flipping over. When you're going through the rapids of life, it's nice to have a friend, someone who will help steady the boat so you don't spin over and drown. And some people by themselves drown in their grief. And we all know, of, have heard stories of people who so despair of life, they take their lives. Job had reached that point, and we'll talk about that a little later. You know, they've also, on the coast of California, one more illustration. 
we live here in Redwood Country. We got Redwoods to the south. They're the inland Redwoods, the Sequoias there by um, uh, Half Dome. And then you've got the Redwoods to the north on the coast. They're called the coastal Redwoods or Sequoias. They're different in that the coastal Sequoias uh, their root system is very shallow so they can absorb as much surface water as possible. You know, some of them get up to 300 feet. They're tallest trees in the world. W but it's amazing. Even though they're 300 feet high, the roots only go maybe six feet down. And you wonder how in the world are they able to withstand the storms that come rolling in off that massive Pacific Ocean? It's because they interlock their roots. You very seldom see them growing by themselves they're usually growing in clusters because they hold each other up by interlocking their roots. And this is God's plan for church. That's why when you become a Christian and you're baptized, as we witnessed a baptism or a couple this morning, you become part of a family. And yes, unlike what Cain said, we are our brother and our sister's keeper. We do need to care for and love and pray for and watch out for each other because sometimes people go through some tremendous storms. This morning, I got an email from a family that attends church here. They're not members yet, but they come. They said, Pastor, please pray for us. I didn't have a chance to mention it to Brother Michael before the prayer. I was going to ask him to include this, but I was back changing after the baptism. They said, oh, we were coming back from one of our son's graduations and the parents flew back with the kids. Grandparents decided to drive, and they're in their 80s, from California to Atlanta and back. Eight miles from home, I think yesterday, they rolled the car. Mom, grandma and grandpa are seriously injured. They're both in ICU, and they said, please pray for this family. It's, the Bermuda's family, the family injured is the Brown family. And uh, I promised that we would keep them in prayer. And she said, it is very hard. She put in the note, it is very hard. Um, have both your parents so seriously injured right after such a, a great occasion. Now, this is the theme of the story of Job. These are, I know the family, we've eaten in their home. Lovely Christian people. And good and bad comes to all. Job's friends kind of didn't understand because they thought good things happen to good people, bad things happen to bad people. And we're going to go now and pick up our story and a little bit of review. Some of you maybe were not here for the first two sections of Job, but in the book of Job, you've got this man who is the greatest of the men of the East, lives in the area of the deserts of Edom somewhere, but it wasn't desert back then. It was more pasture land. It was more of a lush land, actually. And this is south east of the land of Israel, directly east of the land of Egypt. This is where Abraham sent the children that he had by Keturah. You know, Abraham had not only a son by Sarah, and then he had a son by Hagar, but then he married Keturah, and he had several sons through Keturah, but he didn't want them to interfere with the inheritance of Isaac in the promised land, so he said, you take the land to the east. This is where Job and his family are from. Now, if you read, and, and Job, of course, good man, rich man, but there's a meeting in heaven. The devil says, the only reason that Job is serving you is because you bless him, and God gives the devil limited access to Job so that he basically wipes out all of Job's possessions, wipes out his family, and then wipes out his health to try to instigate Job to curse God. And the devil is saying, the only reason Job serves you is because you've blessed him. Stop blessing him, he'll stop loving you. What would happen to us? If God holds back his blessings, do we withdraw our love? Or do we love him in the good times and the bad times? So now Job has lost everything. He's lost his health. He's covered with boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. He shaves his head. He tears his clothes. He sits in the ash heap outside of the city by a dump. He's in terrible misery. His wife is so distraught because of what's happened. She says, 
why do you still retain your integrity? Just curse God and die. And again, we need to understand what she's been through as well. She's grieving, and this has broken her heart. And as this goes on, we take up the story, Job 2, the book of Job, chapter 2, verse 11. Now when Job's three friends, he may have had many other acquaintances, but he had three close friends. These are other leaders. These are sheiks. These are chieftains. These are the patriarchs of areas. When his three friends heard of all this adversity that had come upon him, each one came from his own place. And it names his friends. Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Namathite. Now, just a little tip. There's, we are able to sort of identify Job's three friends, who they were through other scriptures. In reading about this, I thought I ought to let you know there may be one mention of Job himself somewhere else in the Bible. When you read the genealogies in Genesis, who wrote Genesis? Who wrote Job? Probably Moses. Genesis 36, in verse 31 and 33, now these were the kings chieftains, sheiks, the patriarchs, the, the word in Hebrew it means the leaders, who reigned in the land of Edom before any king reigned over the children of Israel, even before Israel had a king, obviously before because Moses wrote it. It says, when Bela died, Jobab, the son of Zerah of Basra, reigned in his place. And so it talks about this person in the land of Edom, right area, his name is not the same as Job, but the Hebrew characters, there's some similarities. Just like in English, you've got, you know, you've got Job and Jobab. My name's Douglas. Most people call me Doug. Only a few call me Dougie. But some of you have more than one name. And you even see this in the Bible. And so some have wondered, was this Job, this king in the area of Edom? It says he was the greatest man of the East. It's possible. But it tells us about his friends. Let's go through them. Their names again, Eliphaz, He's the Temanite. Now, if you look in Genesis 36, 11, uh, I've got a lot of notes, so I don't know if you'll, all of this is going to be taken in. You may want to write some of these down. Genesis 36, 11, it says, The sons of Eliphaz were Teman, Omar, Zilpho, Gatam, and Kenaz. Now, it says Eliphaz the Temanite. Why would he be from Teman if his son is Teman? Well, that's not the first time that happened in the Bible. Look in Genesis 4, 17, And Cain knew his wife, she conceived and bore Enoch, and he built a city and called the name of the city after his son, Enoch. So you have Cain from Enoch. And so it, it's not unusual. Let me give you one more. You can read in the book of um, Obadiah 9. There's only one chapter in Obadiah. Then you mighty men of Teman shall be d dismayed to the end that everyone from the mountains of Esau may be cut off. And so it talks about from the area of Esau was Edom. And that's, this is where Eliphaz is from. He is one of the leaders, probably one of the patriarchs in that area. Then you go down to Bildad, the Shuhite. The word Bildad means son of contention. And there's a little contention that he offers in the discourses that you find in the book of Job. Oh, I didn't tell you. Eliphaz means the name. It means endeavor or strength of God. And you read in Genesis, back to Bildad, Bildad is not mentioned by name, but it talks about his father, Shua. Genesis 25, verses 1 to 2, Abraham again took a wife. Her name was Keturah. This is after Sarah dies. And she bore him Zimran, Jokstan, Medan, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. So Bildad is a son of Shua. The children of Keturah went to the east. By the way, that's Genesis 25, 6. But Abraham gave gifts to the sons of his concubines, which Abraham had. Concubine meaning Hagar and Keturah. And while he was still living, before he even died, he sent them eastward away from Isaac his son to the country of the east. That would be Edom again. So it's, we're filling in the pieces for where this is happening and who these people are. You read in Joshua 15, 21, speaking about, it talks about, um, still talking about Zophar the uh, Namathite, and the word Zophar means to leap. In Joshua 15, 21, the uttermost cities of the tribe of the children of Judah towards the coast of Edom, there you've got it again, and it says in verse 41, Gitteroth, 
Beth Dagon, Nehemiah, and so far as the Nehemathite, so that's where he comes from, and 16 cities with their villages. All right, so these are three friends. These are intelligent people. You read the discourse. They're men of age and experience. They actually take turns talking based upon age. And they've come, they've heard about the misfortune that's come to their friend Job. Greatest man, the Bible says, godly man, wealthiest man, and he has just been blindsided by all these calamities to his family, to his property, to his person. And they send messengers and say, look, let's meet together. It looks like Job is terminal. Let us come and let's see him before he dies. He's our friend. And so they gather. It says they made an appointment. I'm in verse 11. Job 2 verse 11. They made an appointment to come and to mourn with him and to comfort him. And as they get together and they go towards the city and then they see where he is sitting on the pile of broken pottery and the dump and they raise their eyes from afar and they did not recognize him. <coughs> I went and... Uh, I made a hospital visit one time about 30 years ago. Had a member that was 101. A small church. I used to visit him fairly regular. Nicest man in the world. Clyde Cochran. I used to wonder what profession would give you such a long life. He was a paper hanger. And I thought that might be a good reason to hang wallpaper. You live a long time. <laughs> and uh, he was in great shape. 101. Hearing and eyesight wasn't so good, but he was up and around. He was so sweet. He couldn't always make it to church. But every Sabbath he'd get up, he'd dress, he'd put on his Sabbath clothes, he'd wear his tie, he'd sit down, he'd do his Sabbath school lesson by himself. He'd dress up for Sabbath in Sabbath clothes even though he didn't go to church. He said, it's a holy day, I'm going to wear my Sabbath clothes. That's a dedicated man. And then he got shingles. 101. And... Um, so I went by the hospital to visit. And I said, in what room is Mr. Cochran in? And uh, I don't need to worry about anyone recognizing his name because all of his relatives died off. He's so old. And um, I said, he's in this room over here. I went in the room. I looked. I came back out. I said, no, I'm looking for Mr. Cochran. And I said, that's him. And I didn't recognize him. Um, I don't know if you know much about shingles, but it's awful. And uh, he was in so much pain. And I sat by his bedside and I said, Clyde, he couldn't see me. And, but finally when he heard me and realized it was me, he said, oh, pastor. And he took, his hand, took my hand and I had no idea that a man, 101, could squeeze your hand like a vice grip. Part of it was, I think, the pain he was in. But he had such a grip. And he was saying, why doesn't God let me die? And he was in so much agony, and I didn't recognize him. And so I think about that when I read that they see their friend, they know their friend. He was a robust man of dignity, and now he has just been decimated by this disease. They did not recognize him, and they lifted their voices and wept, and each one tore his robe, and they sprinkled dust on their heads towards heaven. That was a sign of mourning. They often did it after a person died. He's still alive. So they sat down with him on the ground seven days and seven nights, and no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his grief was very great. You know, sometimes if you have a friend and they've experienced a great loss, or maybe they're sick and they're going through great physical pain, one of the most important things you can do is to just be with them. You're there. They know you care and you're dividing their sorrows and their pain just by sharing it with them. You don't always have to say anything. I always feel like as a pastor I go visit, I gotta say something. I'm not quite sure what to say. I usually say something dumb like, oh, so how are you feeling? But I don't know what to say. And sometimes it's better if you don't say anything. And you're just with them. And now, I, I didn't want to mislead you with a sermon title where I talk about faithless friends because I want to make it clear, they were friends. If you go see somebody when they're sick and you sit down for seven days and seven nights with them, you've got to be a friend. They did care. They were friends, but their faith in Job wavered. And that's why I titled it Faithless Friends. So they're sitting there 
Seven days. And this is a time of a number of completeness in the Bible. They saw his grief was very great. He's lost everything. You know, the Bible says if you're a Christian and you've got friends, Romans 12, 15, Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those that weep. Sometimes it, we need someone to share good news with. Sometimes we need someone to help us carry the bad news or to help share our sufferings. 1 Corinthians 12, 26, If one member suffers, all members suffer with it. We all bear each other's sorrows. Psalm 35, 13, But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth, David says. I humbled myself with fasting. My prayer would not return to my own heart. In other words, I wasn't praying for myself. I was praying for them. And David said, you know, I cared about my friends. Now, everybody needs friends. We all need friends. There are different levels and degrees of friends. I remember my father used to tell me, in your life you'll be able to count all your real friends on one hand. I thought, wow, how sad. I got a school full of friends. He said, they're not your friends. He said, uh, they're your acquaintances. You go through a trial, you find out who your real friends are. If you go through a financial trial, you really find out who your real friends are. <laughs> because uh, when you're rich, you've got a lot more friends than when you're poor. How many of you know that? That's what the Bible says. The rich has many friends. They're not really friends. Now these were really Job's friends. Facebook right now has 1.65 billion users. That means if Facebook were a country, it would be the most populous nation on earth. That's more than the population of China, 1.36 billion. You've got the nation of Facebook. How did this computer program grow to be such a phenomenon? Because everyone wants to be friended. People want friends. They want to find their old friends they've lost contact with. Now, I won't ask how many of you are on Facebook, but I suggest I would estimate that some of you are part of that 1.65 billion out there. Little pastoral advice. If you're spending more than 20 minutes on Facebook a day, you need to get some help. You need to get some real friends. <laughs> you know, the Bible says loneliness, actually it was John Milton that said loneliness is the first thing God named not good. When God made the world, he said everything is good, good, very good, right? But then he says it's not good that a man should be alone. God made us to be social creatures. We need each other. Mother Teresa said loneliness is the greatest poverty. And Albert Einstein said it's strange to be known so universally and yet be so lonely. Here's this genius, but he felt so lonely. Ecclesiastes 4.9 Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will help his companion. It's the pontoon effect. But woe to him who is alone when he falls. He has no one to help him up. Proverbs 17.17 17, A friend loves at all times and a brother is born for adversity. When you're going through terrible trouble, it's so good to have a brother, meaning a friend, or a sister, somebody that you can confide in. And while we're talking about friends, I'll share a little eccentric quirk I have with you. Is I think once you're married, if you're a man, your friends should be men. And if you're a woman, your friends should be women. Now, you might have some real young or real old friends, but if anybody is in the ballpark of suspicion, I believe you shouldn't be intimate with people of the opposite sex if you're married. And they say, oh, they're just friends. And being a pastor, you know how many times you start seeing something look odd, and they say, oh, no, we're just friends. We're just good friends. And the next thing you know, they're wife swapping and divorcing each other. I've, I've seen it. How many of you know what I'm talking about? David needed a friend for adversity. Who was his friend? Jonathan. He had somebody, they wept together. They, he was going through a trial, running for his life, and it helped him so much. David was hiding in a cave. Jonathan came to him. 
to hold him up, to be his friend. We need friends, brothers and sisters that will help us. Proverbs 18.24, now if you want friends, some people say, I don't have any friends. Well, are you hard to have be friend with? <laughs> it's not everybody else's fault all the time. A man who has friends, Proverbs 18.24, must be himself friendly. Amen? So if you say, I can't find anybody to be my friend, well, are you being a friend? Everybody wants someone to listen to their troubles. Are you a good listener? Do you only want someone to listen to you or will you listen to them? That makes a difference. Proverbs 19.6 Many entreat the favor of nobility and every man is a friend to one who gives gifts. When the prodigal son ran away from home, he had a lot of friends when he had his father's credit card. But once that ran out, they were all gone. A few quotes on friendship. A friend is a person with whom I can think out loud. That's what Emerson says. A friend is one who comes in when the whole world has gone out. A friend is one who knows all about you and likes you anyway. A friend is someone with whom you can dare to be yourself. Aristotle said, what is a friend? A single soul dwelling in two bodies. If you got a close friend, those are the kind where you only have a few in a life. Someone said, there's an old cowboy saying that says, every man will have one good horse and one good dog. And sometimes in life you may have one really good friend. Now Job, his friends have come. Seven days they've sat there as loyal friends. They've listened as he's groaned in pain. They've wept with him. They're keeping vigil. You ever gone to the hospital of somebody and you wonder when they're going to breathe their last? And uh, as a pastor, I've made hospital visits before where family are at the bedside and someone is going through what appears to be a terminal illness. And the family members, I've seen them bring in an extra bed. They're afraid to leave them because they don't want them to die alone. And so they have this vigil. And sometimes I've heard them say they think they've only got a matter of hours and in reality it lasted days. And they never leave the hotel room or the hospital room, sorry. And uh, they're, they're there. Just basically it's a very painful vigil. Sometimes it wears out the family. They're taking turns because they don't want the person to be alone. So Job's friends, they said, boy, it's just gone from bad to worse for Job and now he is as sick as anybody we've ever seen. We don't want to leave him now because as soon as we walk away he'll die alone. So they're kind of, it's almost like a death vigil. They're waiting with him. But then something happens after seven days. Job cannot contain himself anymore. Instead of just groaning and scraping himself, he finally begins to speak. And now I'd like you to go in your Bibles and you can find this in um, Job chapter 3. We finished out Job chapter 2. And Job begins to curse the day of his birth. He's wishing for death is what's really happening. After this, Job opened his mouth and he cursed the day of his birth. And Job spoke and he said, May the day perish on which I was born, and the night in which it was said a male child is conceived. May that, may that day be darkness. May God above not seek it, nor the light shine upon it. May darkness and the shadow of death claim it. You know, that is almost a, an exact quote of something that you find in the book of Jeremiah. If you look in Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 14, Jeremiah says, and this is, if you know the story of Jeremiah, he got lowered into a dungeon filled, it was a, a cistern that had been turned into a dump. And he's in there, he sinks in to the mire and he's left to die. You can understand why Jeremiah would be a little depressed. And listen to what Jeremiah says. Curse be the day in which I was born. Let the day not be blessed in which my mother bore me. Let the man be cursed who brought the news to my father saying a male child has been born to you making him very glad. So Jeremiah cursing the day of his birth. Job cursing the day of his birth. May darkness and the shadow of, the, of death claim it. May clouds settle on it. You guys have your Bibles open? Because I'm going to read a few passages from Job. You're probably wondering 
Pastor Doug, you're thinking, Job has got 42 chapters. How long are we going to do this? <laughs> We're going to cover a lot of ground today. Don't worry. But I'm just going to highlight some of the dialogue. I'm hoping you'll read the book of Job. It's just, it's, uh, like I said, it's the cream in the milk of the Bible. Oh, by the way, it's not all sad. Job ends, it's a good ending to the book. So just hang in there. For that night might darkness seize it. May it not rejoice among the days of the year. May it not come into the number of the months. Oh, may that night be barren. May no joyful shout come into it. May those curse it who curse the day. May those who are ready to arouse Leviathan. Leviathan comes up later. May stars of the morning be dark. May it look for light but have none and not see the dawning of the day because it did not shut up the door of my mother's womb nor hide sorrow from my eyes. Why did I not die at birth? Now, <clears throat> are there any of you who would be willing to admit that there was a time in your life when you said, why was I ever born? Come on, I'm going to ask you to raise your hands. Come on. Teenager, you never wondered? You never having a hard time? I see some of you are fessing up. Why did I have to be born? I remember getting mad at my father and saying to him once, it's your fault that I'm here. <laughs> Any of you ever try that? Why did it not die at birth? Why did it not perish when I came from the womb? Why did the knees receive me or the breasts that I should nurse? For now I would have lain still and been quiet. I would have been asleep. Then I would have been at rest with kings and counselors of the earth who built ruins for themselves or princes who had gold who filled their houses with silver. Why was I not hidden like a stillborn child, like an infant who never saw the light? There the wicked cease from troubling. There the weary are at rest. The prisoners rest together. They do not hear the voice of the oppressor. By the way, if you ever wondered about the state of the dead, this book makes it really clear there's no consciousness in death. The small and the great are there, and the servant is free from his master. And so Job is basically wishing for his death. Now, did he sin? Job is just venting. Is it okay sometimes to, to cry out to God? Have you read some of the discouraging psalms of David? When I say discouraging, there's psalms that are a little dark where David is complaining. I mean, he's running for his life. He's hiding. He's chased out of his inheritance. He's being pursued. They've got a price on his head, and he's discouraged. And David articulates that, and those psalms are inspired. Would this be the first time a man of God wished for death? Numbers 11:15. If you treat me like this, Moses said, please kill me here and now if I found favor in your sight and don't let me see my wretchedness. Elijah, 1 Kings 19:4. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and he came and he sat down under a broom tree. If I was under a broom tree, I'd be depressed too. And he prayed that he might die. And he said, it is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I'm no better than my father's. Prayed that he might die. That's amazing. The day before, he was on the mountain praying, and fire came down. And then he prayed, and rain came down. And now he's praying that he might die. He actually just had low blood sugar. An angel came and fed him. He felt much better. Really. It's, you get tired and hungry, and you say all kinds of things. Jonah 4.3 Therefore now, Jonah's a prophet, Elijah's a prophet, Moses is a prophet. Now therefore, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Samson, it came to pass when Delilah pestered him daily. A number of things can bring you to the point of death. <laughs> Samson was pestered daily with her words pressed in him so his soul was vexed to death. When he told Delilah his secret and she three other times tried to make him lose his strength, did he not know which way this was going to end? It was almost suicide way back then. He ended up bringing down the house on himself. Matter of fact, in Job chapter 3, we're just looking at Job chapter 3, six times Job asks, why, why, why? Is it okay to ask God those questions? I get irritated when people say, well, just accept it. God is sovereign. You shouldn't ask those questions. I think God wants us to reason with him. He says, why did I not die at birth? Why did I not perish? Why did the knees receive me? Why did the breast? And so six times, he says, why, why, why? Why does this happen? 
Now, if you read in Job, chapter 3 and chapter 4 is all one discourse of Job's. Just, and let me give you the picture. Job is, he was the greatest man. You read through the book, it talks about the town, talks about the city gates. There's cities there. There's towns. He was the judge. Everybody knew him. He's now outside the town, the city dump. People in the town know what's happened. When they hear that Eliphaz and Bildad and Zophar have all come from afar, there are people who are coming to watch this. They see them sitting there with Job. It's not like they're all there by themselves. The town is aware of what's happened to Job. One reason this is written down is because someone was there writing down their dialogue. Another character who is a friend of Job appears chapter 32. You don't even hear about him. He appears out of nowhere. It's somewhat mysterious Elihu. He may have come and joined the discussion and started writing this down. So there's people that are listening. So after Job gives out this two chapters of complaint to God, cursing the day of his, of his birth, and he does it very eloquently, finally Eliphaz, this faithful friend who has come from afar to mourn with Job. He's been there for a week he can take no more. You see, something's happened. While they've been watching Job suffer and he doesn't die, and they see all this, they, they, he's lost everything, they begin to think to themselves, why would God do this to any man? Have you ever seen a person suffer and thought, why is God allowing this? Or you see in the history books of POW camp or concentration camp, and folks ask the question, if God is good, why would he allow that? or something terrible happens and plane goes down and you think I guess everybody on that plane deserved it this is one of the most important questions that the book of Job is dealing with good and bad comes to the good and the bad in this life it is a war war is not fair good people and bad people die in a war in this life there are good people that are tempted and the devil sometimes will give bad people blessings and it works both ways uh, Eliphaz is beginning to think to himself Job is suffering because he must have some sin in his life he's done something wrong and he needs to confess this and he finally can't hold it in and he says what the other two friends are also thinking go to chapter 4 Eliphaz responds Eliphaz the Temanite he answered and he said you got your Bibles? chapter 4 Job if anyone attempts a word with you, will you become weary? In other words, you've been talking. We've just been listening. We've been praying. We've been crying with you. But Job, it seems like you're making it sound like you're righteous and you're wondering why God let this happen to you. Probably because you deserve it. Now, did Job suffer because he deserved it? No. Before I give you the answers of Eliphaz and Zophar and Bildad, big question comes up these chapters Job his friend Job his friend Job his friend he, Job alternates between all the friends they take turns We're, when you read the book of Job are only the words of Job true and the words of his three friends they're not scripture what do you do with what they say is it scripture because they go on quite a ways Eliphaz is one of the most verbose or I like using the word loquacious, of all of Job's friends. He has quite a bit to say. I think Bildad says the least. You know the old joke? He's the shortest man in the Bible. Bildad the shoe height. Remember that was a bad joke. I just Nathan said you need to tell that during the sermon. Sorry. But he does give the shortest responses also in the Bible. So I'm asking a question. Is all of the book inspired? I contend that all of what Job's friends say is true. They're speaking though in general terms how God blesses the godly and punishes the wicked. In general terms, everything they say is true. And they say some incredible, these guys, this is back when people lived a hundred years and they still had clear minds. These guys were very bright. They had a lot of life experience. Uh, they're the leaders of towns. Like I said, they're chieftains, or they use the word sheiks. They use the word kings. Um, they, they're patriarchs. And I think that they were saying something that is true, but they were wrong in applying that general truth 
to Job's unique situation. They did not know that Job was under special attack by the devil and a special testing from God. But generally speaking, the principles that they share are good principles. So when you open the book and you, of Job and you quote, you'll see some amazing statements there. You back up and say, now who said this? Is this Job or Bildad or Zophar? And you say, oh, this is Eliphaz. It's wrong. No, no, no. It's the whole book of Job is inspired. Is that clear? Does that make sense? They did not see what was happening behind the veil. They're speaking in general terms about how God deals with the righteous and the wicked. All right, Eliphaz the Temanite says, Lord, uh, Job, can I say something? Will you be weary? But who can withhold himself from speaking? Surely you've instructed many and you've strengthened weak hands. Your words have upheld him who was stumbling and you have strengthened the feeble knees. But now it's come on you and you're weary. You're asking God why. You're the one who is cheering everyone else up. It touches you and you're troubled. Is not your reverence your confidence? You're, you're having confidence in your holiness and the integrity of your ways, your hope, you're trusting in a false reverence and a false hope. Remember now, he said, let's just think about it. Whoever perished being innocent says, you're suffering. You're on the verge of perishing. You must be guilty. You, you can see what the implication is? Or where were the upright ever cut off? Even as I have seen those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. Doesn't Paul quote that? Don't mock God. You're going to reap what you, what you plant. You're, yeah, you're going to harvest whatever you plant. Number, verse 9, By the blast of God they perish, and by the breath of his anger they are consumed. The roaring of the lion, the voice of the fierce lion, and the teeth of the young lions are broken. The old lion perishes for lack of prey, and the cubs and the lioness are scattered. And then, you know, he goes on. I don't have time, as you have gathered. What I'm going to do is just highlight some of the things that are said by the friends of Job in the, bat, in the um, ongoing. So now listen to what Job says and go to chapter 6. And I'm going to verse 14. Job says, To him who is afflicted, kindness should be shown by his friend, even though he forsakes the fear of the Almighty. If you've got a friend that is suffering, Karen and I got a phone call. I had an old friend. Used to go to church. Doesn't anymore. Kind of backslid. Got a call that he's in pretty feeble health. We went to visit. We went to encourage. We went to pray to him. Last thing in the world he needed to hear me say was to chastise him for his backsliding. He needed a friend to encourage him in his suffering, to give him hope. And just because someone is turned away or fallen away, you, that's when friends are really needed. Was Jesus a friend of sinners? Well, they accused him of that. Then should we sometimes have friends out there that we could reach? for the purpose of influencing them and not them influencing us. Job 6 verse 24, teach me and I will hold my tongue. Cause me to understand where have I erred. He said, you show me, where is my sin? I'm following God. Job 7 verse 13, when I say my bed will comfort me, my couch will ease my complaint, then you scare me with dreams and terrify me with visions so that my soul chooses strangling and death rather than my body. I loathe my life. I would not live forever. Let me alone, for my days are but a breath. And you go to Job 13, verse 15. You can see he still is holding on to his faith. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And so that's an incredible statement. No matter what happens, Job is saying, even if he were to slay me, I will not stop trusting him. Job 19, verse 25. One of the great, if you were to have the, the story of Job this discourse be a mountaintop. 19 would sort of be the peak for Job says. It's like a moment of triumph when the clouds broke and the sun shone through. For I know that my Redeemer lives and that he will stand at last upon the earth and that after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I will see God. That must mean a resurrection. If after your flesh is destroyed by worms, you will see God in your flesh whom I will see for myself and my eyes will behold every eye will see him and not another how my heart yearns within me Job says in spite of everything that was happening though he slay me I will still trust him his faith was not conditional on getting something from God have you gone through trials or some discouragement or you feel like your friends don't understand and you feel like you're all alone can you say though he slays me I'll still trust him Circumstances do not control your Christianity. 
It doesn't depend on wealth or health. It's just because God is good. And then you can read in chapter 16. I'm, yeah, Job 16, verse 1. I'm backing up, I know. And Job says to his friends, well, wait, tell you what, I don't want to read that yet. I'm looking at the clock. I knew I couldn't read the whole book, but I want to read a few highlights to you. So you're, you heard, you heard um, Zophar, and, or you, you heard Eliphaz, rather. And if you go to, um, let me see here. Go to chapter 8, verse 1. Then Bildad the Shuhite answered and said, How long will you speak these things and the words of your mouth be like a strong wind? That's <laughs> not very nice. What would you do if your friend said your mouth's like a strong wind? Does God subvert judgment? Or does the Almighty pervert justice? If your sons have sinned against him and he has cast them away for the transgression, if you would earnestly seek God and make your supplication to the Almighty, if you were pure and upright, surely now he would awake for you and prosper your rightful dwelling place, though your beginning was small, in the latter end you would increase abundantly. In other words, God is not unjust. If this is happening to you, you deserve it. See what he's saying? And of course, chapter 8 is pretty short because it's Bildad. You know, Job says something else in um, chapter 3. He says, the thing that I feared has come upon me, have you ever wondered, does that mean Joe lived in fear? Does that mean Job didn't have faith? And people say, Joe feared he'd lose his money. Job feared he'd lose his health. You know the one thing the book of Job tells us he was fearful of? When his sons and daughters were feasting, he was afraid that they might die unprepared, and so he prayed for them. As soon as their days of feasting were done, he called them together, he interceded, you know, it's a good lesson for us that we should keep short accounts with God. And uh, if there is some sin, right away, pray, so repent of it immediately. Job feared for the salvation of his kids. And so when he says, the thing I feared has come upon me, it wasn't for his money, it wasn't for his health, it was for the ones he loved. And that's the thing that uh, was troubling him. All right, so you, you heard from Bildad. And... Um, then if you keep going here, let's see, I think you've got Zophar is verse 11, chapter 11, sorry. Zophar, the Naamathite, he answered, and let's see, Job answers Bildad, Job answers Elahaz, Eliphaz, rather. Then Zophar, the Naamathite, answered and said, should not the multitude of words be answered? <laughs> he said, Job, you've got a multitude of words. They all start like that. We've got to answer you. Should not a man full of talk be vindicated? Should your empty talk make men hold their peace? And when you mock, should no one rebuke you? For you have said, my doctrine is pure, I am clean in your eyes. But oh, that God would speak and open his lips against you, that he would show you the secrets of wisdom, for they would double your prudence. Know therefore that God exacts from you less than your iniquity deserves. Job, you're suffering, but you probably deserve more. People sometimes say, Pastor Doug, how are you doing? I always say, better than I deserve. Because it is true. What is the penalty for sin? Death. But compared to people on the planet, the only man on earth God could look down to and say, have you beheld my servant Job, one who fears God and hates evil, was Job. So if anybody on the planet had a right to say, why God? That was Job. He was faithful. Zophar got it wrong. Bildad got it wrong. Eliphaz got it wrong. They were his friends, but they misunderstood Job. You know, one other thing, in, in one of Job's answers, chapter 10, I'm almost done, chapter 10, verse 18, Job says, why did you bring me out of the womb? Oh, that I had perished and no eye had seen me. I would have been as though I had not been. I would have been carried from the womb to the grave. And I know that's a very difficult verse, but I'll tell you why I read that to you. I get in, asked a question frequently, Pastor Doug, there, you know, the numbers I hear are 50 million babies in North America aborted each year. And uh, will they all be in heaven? And, uh, you know, there are obviously going to be children resurrected and brought to their parents. But someone says, will every aborted baby be saved? This is one of the verses in the Bible that makes it sound like there will be some that will be as though they had not been. And he talks about a miscarried baby. Now, if there are Christian parents, I think the Lord will bring those parents that baby. 
But I think you've got to stop short of saying that every miscarried child is automatically saved of the saved or the lost because if you do the math, heaven would be a virtual nursery. We will be swimming in babies in the resurrection. And I know that's a difficult verse, but that's where I get that from the Word of God. And by the way, that's supported by the spirit of prophecy. So, Job's friends are sitting there and they start out, they're, they're coming to encourage him, but they end up being the source of discouragement. And uh, finally, go to chapter 16, verse 5. Uh, chapter 16, I'm sorry, verse 1. Job 16, 1. Then Job answered and said, I have heard many such things. I've been listening to you. Miserable comforters are you all. <laughs> They've come to comfort him, supposedly, and they did at first. They sat, they wept with him, they were quiet, but then they started talking. Can you see how much trouble you can get in when you try to tell someone why? I've had to do funerals before where you have a little white casket. You know what that means. Someone lost their child. And people come up and they say, Pastor Doug, why did this happen? You've got to be very careful of thinking you've got an answer for everything. Sometimes you just got to say, you know, I don't know why. I trust God. I, I, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. I don't know why. And Job says, you came to comfort me. Miserable comforters are you all. I could also speak as you do. If your soul were in my soul's place, I could heap up words against you and shake my head at you, but I would strengthen you with my mouth and the comfort of my lips would relieve your grief. He said, I wouldn't come to accuse you. So even if you think a person is suffering because of their mistakes or their bad judgment, God wants you to comfort them, to lift them up. Now, in conclusion, you've heard me say that already, haven't you? I'm not going to be able to read all of Job, but we've still got a couple more messages on Job. Job has reached the bottom. I said everything I just said in the last three messages because I wanted you to realize that he has been scraped down to the core of his soul. He has been left just absolutely at the bitter end. He lost his stuff. He lost his children. His wife despaired. Lost his health. Now his friends that he thought were there to comfort him, he's finally thrown his hands in the air and said, you are a bunch of miserable comforters. He doesn't have his friend's support. He has lost every earthly support. I want to read you a quote from the book Maranatha, page 173. In the last great conflict of the controversy with Satan, those who are loyal to God will see every earthly support cut off. Why am I preaching about Job? Because the day may come as we near the end that we will see every earthly support cut off. And our only dependence is going to be on God. Does that mean your family's all going to turn on you? Not necessarily. You might be in jail where you just can't get their support. You might be alone in the woods. I don't know what will happen. But you are going to experience the barrenness of soul that Job experienced. And the only thing that you're going to be able to hang your hope on is what a friend we have in Jesus. We started with this verse in John 15. Jesus is our friend. Greater love has no one than this, that he would lay down his life for his friends. Do you ever question if he's your friend? He died for you. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. Jesus said, are you my friend? Are we like Job's friends? No longer do I call you servants. A servant does not know what his master is doing, but I've called you friends. I've opened my heart to you. For all things that I've heard from my Father, I've made known to you. Short of the second coming date, he opened his hearts to them. Jesus wants to be our friend. There's a poem I read once. It says, There are those who pass like ships in the night, who meet for a moment and then sail out of sight, who never a backward glance of regret. Folks we know briefly, then quickly forget. Then there are friends who sail on together, through quiet waters and all stormy weather, helping each other through joy and through strife, and these are the kind who give meaning to life. We all need friends. We need friends as a church community. We need friends in our families, but especially we need to make sure that Jesus is our friend because he's the only one who will never leave us and forsake us. We will see every earthly support taken away. You may lose your possessions. You may lose your health. You may lose your family and your friends. 
But Jesus said, I will never leave you and forsake you. Is that good news? That's why we're going to sing about it. What a friend we have in Jesus. This is Karen's favorite song. And that number is 499. I'll invite our singers to come out. What a friend we have in Jesus. Can we stand together as we sing? perfect song for this message today. Amen. Even though your friends might despise and forsake you, Jesus said, I will never leave and forsake you. We can trust in the Lord. All of us go through trials in life. This man who is a man after God's heart even got to the point of despairing of life, but God never left him or forsook him. He was watching him and close to him through the whole ordeal. Amen. And Jesus will be that kind of friend. You know, we're going to have our closing prayer, but before we do, we want to have a special prayer for those who are baptized today. Now, Buck's mother was not well, and he needed to go home and be with his mother, but I'd like to invite Daniel Bibby, if he'd come up for a moment, and we'll have, yeah, we'll just include him in our closing prayer. Father in heaven, we just are so thankful for the message in the book of Job that uh, there may be trials in life, and there may be times when we feel that every earthly support has been withdrawn, but you never leave us. And even our friends might misunderstand and sometimes not seem like friends. I pray, Lord, that you will help us to just hang all of our, our trust in you, saying with Job, even if you slay us, we will trust you. Lord, this is a supernatural kind of faith that we can't have without your spirit, but we pray that you give it to us. Help us to have that experience through the time we spend now in prayer and in your word to build that kind of love relationship. We ask your blessing on all the families represented here. Be in a special way with the Bermudas family and the Browns who just experienced this accident. And Lord, we, spay, we rejoice and we pray that you'll be with Buck and be with Daniel and who've been baptized today. Fill them with your spirit as you promised and just prepare them for their lives of service for you. 
Thank you for your goodness and your blessings and be with us through this Sabbath day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless. You may be seated.